Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Max Outschuler. How are you doing, Max? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And Max is the author of the book, Hacking Sales. And there you go. The book there. Highly recommend this book. Uh, as he says here, this is an interesting statistic. Uh, 40% of the Fortune 500 from the year 2000 were no longer Fortune 500 in the year 2015 because they failed to evolve. So, Max, what's your philosophy around uh, uh, hacking sales and evolution? What, what, what are you talking about here in terms of evolution? Yeah, so I uh, I took over as uh, I guess not took over, but I was the first sales hire at a uh, online education marketplace called Udemy. Um, we raised a small seed round of funding, so we were resource strapped. We didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of uh, human capital. Uh, you know, butts and seats uh, is another way to say it. So we had to find a way to generate more revenue using less resources, and that was kind of the impetus for sales hacking. So I approached uh, you know, sales at that time, first time ever doing it. You know, in a mindset of what would, how would I do this if this was a, if I was doing this from scratch right now? What would this look like if it was built in, you know, today? Uh, and so, you know, at the time, you know, I had a, a, a knack for outsourcing stuff. So I used my outsourcing skills and built a team in the Philippines that ended up being a, a key piece of the process in the, uh, in the SDR uh, capacity. And then I was using tools that weren't meant for sales. Uh, to give them direction. So we're using keyword SEO tools mm. uh, to generate strings for them to do searches for. So I didn't have to tell them what to search for every time. They could just put the strings together themselves. Um, we were one of ToutApp's first customers, which now, you know, the leaders in the space are Outreach and SalesLoft and, you know, Marketo and Salesforce mm. have their own, you know, products in that space, HubSpot too. Um, but, you know, we were, uh, we just wanted to stay ahead of the curve. We wanted to figure out, all right, if we're going to to really scale this thing faster than anybody's done, you know, before we need to build something that nobody's really ever built before. We need to redo the machine uh, and and build it in a modern way. So that was that was kind of how we came out with or, or came up with kind of sales hacking. And at the time, you know, I didn't I didn't coin that term. Like growth right. hacking came first. Sure. And I had a, actually had a buddy, a, a real close friend of mine, Ryan Buckley. At the time, I didn't even know him, and he wrote an article. He was running another marketplace called Scripted, which is a writer's uh, mm-hmm. content marketplace. And he wrote an article on his, you know, maybe his own Medium uh, blog or something like that about how he was scraping uh, sites like Crunchbase using uh, certain, you know, uh, Python and, and different mm-hmm. queries and code. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. He called it sales hacking. So we ended up meeting up talking really obviously hitting it off on the on the things that we were doing uh separately and then it started uh to evolve into a meetup uh you know for other people who were leveraging technology and you know, kind of hacks in the sales process to generate more revenue using less resources obviously that rolled into conferences which rolled into mm-hmm. meetups which rolled into the current business you know that I run right now yeah and one of the things that's fascinating when you were just saying about you know query strings and all of that is the idea of uh, identifying your ideal customer because i still find that today a lot of organizations or people that you'll talk to when you ask them like who is your ideal customer you would think everybody would have it neat tightly defined but there's still a lot of people where it's kind of fluffy yeah most people don't don't really know what their ideal customer is. You know, it's it's amazing how many people haven't really gone out and figured out, you know, their top, you know, few hundred or few thousand target accounts. Um, you know, it's one of the first things you should be doing, understanding, you know, uh, you know, when you when you put together business plans, which, you know, aren't as relevant now as they sure. used to be, but you know, the first thing you did was figure out your total addressable market, then your serviceable uh, addressable market, your serviceable obtainable market. I think it was uh, Tam, Sam, and Sam were like the you know the three different you know buckets, and you broke it down. Okay, like this is the overall massive. Okay, all these people could potentially be customers, I guess, all the way down to like if this person is doing this, then they're you know exactly our customer. You know, just like uh, Airbnb, how they started. If you went on Craigslist and you found somebody who was renting their apartment out or looking to rent an apartment, they should be on Airbnb. Right. You know that that person is your ideal customer versus somebody who um, maybe uh, maybe has a home that they never ever leave, 
You know, <laughs> that's not part of your total addressable market. That person is not your ideal customer. They are never going to leave their house, right. you know, so that you don't need to worry about trying to get them onto your platform. So just making sure you decipher those two. I think the the best example and one that I I used, you know, a lot when I speak at conferences is, you know, it's it's, it's a funny story, but it's also you know perfect proof of this. There was a, a Girl Scout, you know, selling Girl Scout cookies, and she uh, she put her table out with her cookies right in front of a marijuana dispensary in San Francisco, <laughs> and broke the record for the amount of you know boxes of cookies she sold. Because she knew her ideal customer. She knew that people who were going to go buy, you know, uh, cannabis, whatever products might be hungry later and have the munchies, and then go and you know buy a bunch of cookies and you know prepare for later. Versus if she set up the same thing in front of a vegan, gluten free, <laughs> where people, one, have just eaten, so they're not hungry, and yeah. two, can't eat the things that you're selling because they can't have, you know, sugar or, right. you know, bread or whatever, she's not going to sell any boxes. So it's literally the only thing she did was know her ideal customer profile. She didn't need to sell anything. She didn't need to open her mouth. She didn't need to give a sales pitch. She didn't need to have collateral. She just needed to be in front of the right people at the right time. And that's one of those things, you know, you go into, you know, uh, BANT, for example, mm-hmm. like budget, sure. authority, heat, and timing, on them, whatever acronym you want to use. And I think at the same time we were building these kind of sales hacky processes, what happened is – that inf- everybody could almost be pre-qualified right. before you talk to them because there's so much information on the internet these days between LinkedIn and services like uh, Crunchbase and PitchBook and and even just like you know for public companies, mm-hmm. plenty of ways that you can get filing information to see you know uh, what revenues were, where they're spending money, where they're hiring people, what their growth rate looks like. You could understand what their budget is, who the authority is, if there's a need, and if it's the right timing on the internet without ever having to talk to somebody. So. You know, it almost changes how you sell these days because you're able to, um, you know, get so much further in the sales process before uh, you even speak to someone. So, so once you have, um, so you you identified your ideal target customer down to a, a good level of detail, then obviously that allows you to look at a few different ways of selling, right? Of of, you know, whether you want to direct sell, whether you want to outsource your selling, you know, what you want to do. But having that tight definition is really the key to deciding which way you're going to go to market, right? Yeah, you know, I'm a big fan of going to market. You know, uh, I think Aaron Ross from Predictable Revenue, you know, said like seeds, nets, and spears. Well, you know, I like to, you know, from a go to market marketing perspective, understanding your your messaging and how you're going to talk to your ICP and going out and being able to to market to those channels while also building out target accounts and pinpointing those target accounts and going deep into those target accounts. So you could do a mix of the two. One works kind of passively in the background that, you know, just kind of works for you over time. And those are things that are, you know, more like future proof, like communities and the brand and content, things like that, that will work for you 24 seven. And then there are things that, uh, you know, are a little bit more, uh, you know, targeted and, and not as future proof. You're only as good as your last conversation. You're only as good as the last dollar spent, which is the more like targeted account based, you know, sales and marketing type stuff. So, you know, if you're going in and deep on an account and that account's worth a million dollars, like, all right, you know, if you know if you if you can make a million dollars on that account and you have some budget, you know, marketing budget, then maybe it's worth um, you know, taking people out to dinner, or going flying into sure. a customer, things that cost a little bit of money but are worth it, you know, if the dollar value is high enough. But again, in those scenarios, you're only as good as your last dollar, you're only as good as your last conversation versus, you know, the uh, wider uh, kind of you know, broader way of doing it, which is, you know, developing content that's going to appeal to a wider audience that's going to develop its own funnel uh, for inbound. So how do you, uh, one of the things today, right, is, okay, a lot of uh, buyers are, you know, there's a lot of noise out there. They're getting bombarded from left, right, and center every time they, you know, open up their email or LinkedIn or everybody's coming at them in in all these different directions. How do you, how can you differentiate and cut through that noise to be the one that actually they'll listen to? Yeah, have a conversation and provide value. I think, uh, you know, there was an old... uh, Saying, not sure what to attribute to, but if you, you if you want, uh, if you want money, ask for advice. 
You know, it's like when you're fundraising, you don't like go around asking people for money. You go around asking people for advice. I think sales is is, is very similar. Uh, you don't go up to somebody and try and sell them or pitch them, right? You go up to them and ask them a question, start start a conversation, or provide value to them that's going to start a conversation or want them to do, you know, is going to provide them value so that they come back to you when they want more value. Uh, and that's that's the kind of modern way to sell now. You know, I I, I was. I was uh, speaking in front of a group of entrepreneurs uh, maybe a month ago in New York City, and they were, t- you know, one, somebody brought up, you know, how do I, what's the best way for me to like network and sell through conferences? Right. And, and you know, he's like, I don't have a, I don't have a script, I don't have my email cadence, so, you know, I'm kind of out in the wild. And I'm like, well, you know, first, first two things you want to establish are your go-to introduction the way to enter a conversation mm-hmm. and your go-to way to exit a conversation. The second thing is you want to have questions and be able to build a conversation that's going to take people to, you know, what you do. You don't want to just go in there and start pitching what you do. So, you know, you walk in, you walk into a conversation, you shake somebody's hand, hey, uh, you know, this is who I am, quick. Uh, who are you? What do you do? Get into a conversation. And start to say like, oh, okay, cool. What, well, what are the like couple things that keep you up at night in your business? You know, really get into their business a little bit, ask them questions, and it's almost like taking things full circle. So you're asking these questions, you're having a conversation, and you're waiting till something sticks out that you could latch onto that correlates to what you're selling. So while you're having this conversation, you're kind of guiding them to their to the answer that you want them to have. He who asks the questions own the conversation, right? right. So. Um, you know, it's this kind of like modern way of selling in which, you know, you're not actually selling. You are asking questions. You're providing value um, if you can, you know, uh, any introductions you can make that are relevant, any articles that you can send them that, you know, are relevant to things that they might be interested in. You know, maybe uh, we have an article on Sales Hacker or something like that on something that they mentioned they had a pain point or uh, a problem with. And you say, oh, hey, I, I saw this and thought of you that's another way to, to kind of get in good graces and, you know, be on their radar. And then there's the, uh, you know, a law of, uh, I think it's effective frequency or law of sevens, which is, you know, take seven touches for mm-hmm. someone to recognize you or remember you. So if you're, if you are doing your cadence, if you are calling, if you are, you know, providing value, even if they're not getting back to you, each one of those is another touch. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to surround an account. You can do phone, email, in person, direct mail, social, you know, probably a million other things. So you want to, you want to find ways to make sure that, you know, if they're active on Twitter, you know, can you get your name in front of them, right. even just retweeting or tweeting and stuff? Can, if you're, they're on LinkedIn, make sure you connect and send them a follow up. Um, you know, uh, great meeting you at X the other day. Uh, let's stay in touch. And, you know, if they're on email, make sure you're sending them. Uh, it doesn't have to be a cadence. It could be, uh, here's an article, you know, thought of you. Um, so just like staying relevant and making sure you're getting those touch points. And obviously, as you say, is mixing it up a little bit and figuring out how they like to be communicated with, right? So if, yeah. if Twitter is the place for them or if email or um, face to face. One of the things that always strikes me is a sales process, right? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of companies I know have established sales processes a long time ago and really, um, you know, may look at them every couple of years in a cursory way, but we're in such a different uh, dynamic now and rapid pace of change that I feel like sales process is something that you need to look at and it needs to be dynamic and you need to be a, a compl- continually evolving it to meet buyers' needs. How, how important do you think, um, you know, looking at and really uh, updating or evolving your sales process is? I think it's one of those things that like everything you do in life that, that is a process should be um, – tested, measured, and optimized, and you should have a cadence to it, whether it's quarterly, monthly, yearly, whatever that is. But, you know, you should always be taking a pulse on it and saying, okay, is this the, it, are we doing this the best way we could be doing this? Can we multivariable or A-B test, you know, certain areas of this to see if we can optimize it and do better than we're currently doing? Um, you know, should we, should we hire someone who doesn't fit you know, the, the mold in our internal organization and see if they outdo the current mold and maybe that's the direction we should go in. Should we, um, you know, try a piece of technology in, you know, this area of our process and see if it, you know, if it moves the needle. If you're not, 
you know, if you're not trying to evolve and, and do better um, at every chance you can, you're not throwing stuff at the wall, you're not testing new channels, uh, testing new hypotheses or, or theories, uh, eventually you'll, you'll go stale or the stuff you'll, you'll, you're doing will stop working and your, your competitors will lap you because they're going to be trying those things. Mm -hmm. Or you'll just be in this, this, you know, place where it's like, oh shit, we didn't prepare for this. Mm -hmm. So now what are we going to do? We need to, we need to figure this out from scratch and it's going to take us a while to ramp. Like you could be hitting the numbers that you're hitting right now right. And at the same time, trying new things that are going to get you ahead, um, you know, later without losing a beat. But if you get stuck and you're not trying those things and then the numbers go down, you're like, oh shit, what do we do? You're going to have a couple months of that before it even you know, gets a chance to come back up. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, um, sales is one of those areas that traditionally you know, people don't look at new ideas or look at change until they hit an iceberg, right? It's normally when sales falls off a cliff is when they go, oops better start looking at something new but what you're saying is they should be even if you're doing okay or well right now you should be continually looking at uh, innovation or different ways or testing other things that you could be doing yeah well you know uh, the decision maker is going to change too you know there are people who there are people who've been in sales for 20 years and like well what i'm doing is still working so i don't need to change well if you if you're going to work for another 10 to 20 years your decision maker might be changing. Right. You know, you're looking at uh, more and more millennials. I think the, the the high end of the millennial age group is now like 35 or 36 or 37 or something like that. So in the next 10 years, they're going to be in their 40s. So they're going to be decision makers. Most millennials are native to text. They're mm -hmm. born texting, or sure. at least you know had cell phones around the time where you know when you got a cell phone, it had texting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know graduated high school and Facebook uh, existed. Uh, use a product like Slack or you know, Gchat. Uh, grew up with AOL instant messaging. So the way that they communicate in general is different. So if, you, if you've been selling for the last 20 years and, and you're gonna retire soon, then yeah, maybe don't adapt. But if you're gonna you know, keep going for another 10 or 20 years, you might wanna pay attention to some of the, the ways that people are evolving and things are changing. And um, you know, I think a lot of the there are a lot of things that are timeless in human relationships and in sales. And there are, uh, you have to, I think you have to like decide who you're going to pay attention to and who you're going to listen to. And, you know, the way I love to get advice is from listening to people tell their stories and then deciding, okay, well, there are a lot of variables there. So let's see which ones are, which ones, what, what can I pull from this story that I can use and what it might be a, um, you know, a circumstance or, or a situation that hinged on those variables that I don't exactly have. And I think in sales is the same way. I'm going to tell you and sales hackers are going to tell you a bunch of things to do from a tech perspective, uh, from a lot of people who are throwing things at the wall and are doubling down on what's working and cutting what's not. And, you know, we're going to have a different viewpoint maybe than somebody who's been doing it the same way for 20 years and it's always worked. And that's fine. If you're out there looking for advice and, and you know, uh, trying to figure it out on your own, it, it's definitely good to get out there, have mentors, have advisors, have you know publications like ours, and and listen to you know people who have different opinions from ours, and just be able to tell in your situation, okay, well, um, this person sell, sells to the enterprise, and their decision maker is you know X, Y, and Z, and they're in this industry, so maybe they're the most relevant person for me to to listen to, or um, you know. Uh, something similar to that where it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to listen to this person because they sell to SMB right. and I sell enterprise and like what they're saying has nothing to do with mm -hmm. the, the types of companies that buy from me. So, uh, um, I think, you know, the, in the, the, the direction we're going, you know, you want to keep evolving, but at the same time you want to, um, you know, make sure you're getting your information from the right sources and you're, you're cognizant of, you know, what that right source means to you. Yeah, I think that's I think that's great advice because as I said there's a lot of there's a lot of great content out there. There's a lot of people you can listen to out there. I think being uh, discerning in who you're listening to is is good advice. Um I also think that unfortunately not enough people professionals be they sales professionals or other invest enough time in their own personal development and educating yeah. themselves as opposed to waiting for the the company to put them through training. Yeah. Um 
at the end of the day, we're all responsible for our own careers, right? It's the best thing about sales is that, you know, if you're in a good organization and you're on commission, like your life could be uncapped. And so, you know, I, I've seen plenty of reps who, uh, who bought technology one seat because their company wouldn't right. buy it. And they're like, well, I'll spend the $79 a month mm-hmm. to get it to get a leg up on everything, make president's club, you know, uh, have the highest, you know, uh, be the number one rep in the company, et cetera, et cetera, $79, like screw it. Um, you know, I've seen reps pay north of $2,000 for per month for, for their own software. Um, because you know, you make, you're like you're a little entrepreneur inside your own business. You can make as much sky's the limit, you know, in, in a lot of organizations, uh, good organizations. So, um, you know, you'll see, more and more of that happen and you know it's a it's a good place to be in sales yeah no i'm i'm a big believer in that when i got my first ever um executive level uh, position years ago the first thing i did was i went outside and i hired an executive coach um paid for it myself nobody in the company knew about it but i thought you know i need to uh i need to put my best foot forward here yeah Okay, well, listen, we're bumping up against the end of the time. Max, I'd like to give you an opportunity to tell people a little bit more about yourself, a little bit more about your company, what you do, and how they can learn more about you. Yeah, so uh, I'm on LinkedIn, pretty active, Max Outchuler. I'm sure you can see the spelling and the link in the show notes. Yep. Um, SalesHacker.com is the site. Uh, you know, it's all B2B uh, sales and practitioner-led, so... A lot of the content is from other people at other organizations just like yours who are you know, uh, writing about their journey. It's all actionable, tactical, educational, non-promotional. Um, we work with uh, Salesforce, Microsoft, Marketo, HubSpot, LinkedIn, DocuSign, Adobe, all the way down to some of the up-and-coming vendors like Outreach, Sales Off, Drift, Gong, Chorus, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to do educational content. Um, again, non-promotional stuff. So. We work with sales vendors. We work with VPs of sales um, and CROs across the board at non-sales vendors. Um, and right now, we've got about 80,000 uh, subscribers and 150,000 visitors uh, per month um, to Sales Hacker that are all learning um, from the podcast, the webinar, uh, webinars we do, uh, virtual events, and the blog. Uh, wrote the book, Hacking Sales. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, right now, I think it was, I think it was like 2018, 2016, so 2016. Uh, yeah, <laughs> 2016. I think it was, yeah, 2016, yeah. 2016, uh, this came out. And then the newest book is Career Hacking for Millennials, um, which was just a, a passion project, something to give back. Oh, um, you know, a lot of my trials and tribulations and failures and a couple, a couple successes here and there <laughs> have taught me a lot. And, uh, you know, as you couldn't tell, I'm very self-reflective and, uh, very much someone who builds, tests, measures, and optimizes, trying everything that I do. So uh, it's full of kind of all those key learnings, uh, and that's more of like a, a personal thing. So uh, that's where you can find me. That's what I'm up to. And uh, oh, and the, and the last thing is, I also created a healthy coffee alternative called Sutra Sip mm. Sutra. Com and uh, been coffee caffeine free for the last six years. So oh wow, well good for Co- you. Coffee. What's it called again? Uh, Sutra, SipSutra.com, S-U-T-R-A. Okay. Well, my my wife is a serious coffee addict, so I'll see. She'll test it out. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, you know, I've been caffeine free for six years, and uh, and I've you know, if you have a tea, it's just like kind of like a bitter water, and I, I like tea, but it's not like a hearty, robust mm-hmm. beverage. And so this is a hearty, robust beverage made with uh, superfoods like uh, turmeric, maca root. Um, Let's see, ginger on one of them, and then and a couple other things, and then reishi mushroom, uh, raw cacao, and activated charcoal on the other one. One tastes like hot cocoa, one tastes like chai tea, and it's nice, hearty, robust, flavorful, beautiful to look at, and uh, it gives you like healthy, natural, balanced energy. So, yeah. Excellent. So there you go. That's a first for um, for Sales Pop. Not only did we bring you some good sales insights, but we also brought you some health tips as well. Yeah. Love it. Listen, thanks very much, Max. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeline of CRM. I'll see you all for another Expert Insight interview really soon. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.